last couple of years, we've seen scandal after scandal. I do think we have incredible amounts of inefficiency. There's a lot of waste. We all are frustrated by similar things. Attention, bar rider. Hey, San Francisco, I'm Ben Kaplan, and this is the podcast where we define who we are and who we want to be. We are San Francisco. Hey, everyone. Welcome to We Are San Francisco. Today, we've got a really exciting show lined up. I'm sitting down with four fantastic guests who are all running for District 3 Supervisor. Danny Sauter, Edward Navarro, Mo Jamil, and Sharon Lai. These are some of the key players shaping the future of one of San Francisco's most important districts. We're going to dive into the big issues, housing, public safety, the local economy, and hear how they plan to make a difference. Each of them brings something different to the table, and I think you're going to get a lot out of this conversation. So let's jump right in and meet the candidates. And Sharon, why at this particular moment did you decide to run for the Board of Supervisors? I'm running right now because San Francisco has become a really difficult place for working families to stay. We're squeezing the middle class out. And I want to make sure that we have competence uh, at City Hall as well as balanced leadership. Uh, We need to be collaborating. We need to be convening. We need to be rowing in the same direction so that San Francisco can get back on track. Mo, interested to hear what you think. Right now in San Francisco in 2024, we have a unique opportunity to bring some new fresh ideas and new faces to City Hall. In District 3, we have haven't had an open election since 2008. I had some great conversations with folks and decided to raise my hand uh, to be part of that new generation of leadership that this city needs. What do you think, Danny? This is the most important election on the Board of Supervisors, and I truly believe that. District 3 is a set of incredible neighborhoods, but there's some neighborhoods that are hurting right now. Neighborhoods like Fisherman's Wharf and Union Square. Most of the financial district is in District 3, uh, and these are neighborhoods that are challenged from the pandemic. These are neighborhoods that are challenged from tourism still being slow to recover. Uh, so I really see these next four years in District 3 setting the course for the next four years in San Francisco. Edward? There's a lot to defend here. It's a model that I haven't seen anywhere else where you might know somebody for 30 years, not know their last name, not know what they do, but still very be uh, good friends, right? That's a, that's a very particular thing about San Francisco. And I think my practical background allows me to help on a lot of the issues that are at stake currently, for example, housing or issues about public space. And Mo, for those who don't know, District 3, it's an interesting district because it encompasses a lot of different cultural backgrounds. Describe District 3 for people who just aren't a resident and don't know exactly. District 3 is the greatest supervisor district in America. It is the golden goose of San Francisco. It is the northeast corner of the city. It has some of the most historic and oldest neighborhoods in the city. It is a truly an amazing place. It is very diverse. It is the economic engine of the city. Uh, When the TV cameras show up, they come to District 3. And that's why it's critically important that we have strong leadership in that seat. What do you think, Edward? It has a connection to the water with Barbary Coast and the wharf. It has all the different makeup of the city, including Chinatown, Polk Gulch, Union Square, Financial District. So it is definitely a microcosm of of the city. Sharon, interested to hear what you think. San Francisco grew out of the areas of District 3, right? The first boat that landed was a Portsmouth Square in Chinatown. So we play an important role for, you know, uh, the the front door and the presence of who San Francisco and who we are as San Franciscans. Danny? It's the neighborhoods that usually you'll see on postcards and see in the media. It's a really expansive district, a really important district. Um, There's some studies that show up to 70% of our city's revenue comes out of District 3. It's that important. And Danny, what is the difference differentiator with you and other candidates? There's a lot of candidates. There's the contested race, <laughs> sure, it's a competitive sure. race. Yeah. What separates you from the others? I'm not waiting to get into office to do the work. I've been an uh, organizer over the past 10 years in District 3. Um, you know, This isn't a seat that we can afford to have someone get in there and, and try to learn on the job. This is a seat where we need someone who knows these, these neighborhoods already, knows the community leaders in the neighborhoods, the presidents of the neighborhood associations, the small businesses, knows the history and the background. I, I think that's what the voters of District 3 deserve. I think that's what they're asking for. It's easy to get involved all of a sudden in an election year, even to move to the district in an election year like we've had candidates to do. But to be there every year for this past decade, especially in really difficult years, difficult times like the pandemic, I think that's what really sets me up part. Edward, what about you? 
I, I come from an international background. Of, I'm only in the city two and a half years, so I'm new. That's usually seen as as a as a potential negative. But I think it also permits me to see the city in a light that somebody who's been here all their time uh, can't see. I'm also um, the only LGBT candidate on on the ballot. I'm only the, the only Hispanic candidate on the ballot. I think we need more Hispanic voices in California. California is 50% uh, Hispanic. The state started out with a constitution that was both in Spanish and English. Um, and I think there's an underrepresentation. So that's a, also a difference. I come from an entrepreneurial ba background. I'm used to um, uh, being resourceful to get things done and being effective in getting things done. I started out with a development company, real estate development company in the state of Georgia that was focused on building walkable small towns where I would design the urban space, I would um, uh, confection the, the financing, uh, gather capital in order to get things done, uh, get rezonings done. So, I, you know, very involved in a lot of complexity and detail. It's not just the corporate capacity, but rather uh, the sensibility around how these things should be managed. All right, Sharon, your thoughts. You know, I think what really sets me apart is, you know, competence and expertise. Uh, you know, that's what my race is about. But what really sets me apart is that I'm the only candidate in this race that have deep working experience in the public, private and nonprofit sectors. I am somebody who really believes in the three legged stool of making sure that we have you know diverse stakeholders at the table. I think having that balanced uh, backdrop of expertise and working in business and in development, working in nonprofit, not just starting it, but also running it successfully, as well as having been city staff and a commissioner. So providing oversight on city departments and holding them accountable. These are all core skill sets, basic skill sets, I would even argue, uh, that I think Board of Supervisors really need to be able to be effective oversight um, for the city as a whole. Mo, what about you? I am the deeply rooted neighborhood candidate in this race who's also a uh, competent, established uh, attorney uh, uh, in this city. Public safety is a huge theme. Uh, and the fact that I have stood up and said, I believe that we need to double down on our police department and we need to have the back of the rank and file officers. We really need to double down on clean and safe San Francisco. And that means having the back of our police department. And I'm proudly endorsed by several retired San Francisco police officers, including prominent um, officers in the Chinese American community, like former Deputy Chief Garrett Tom and Captain Bobby Yick. And Mo, what is one idea or policy that's been suggested by a competitor that you think is worthy of consideration? One of my competitors, Ms. Sharon Lai, uh, suggested is having a public safety uh, liaison within uh, the district. And I think that is very important. There's a lot of great ideas there. Uh, the, the question is who has the relationships in the community and who has the trust of the community to get those ideas off the finish line. And I think I stand head and shoulders above everyone on that. For example, I agree with Danny Sauter that we need more Cantonese speaking police officers. Okay, Sharon. Most of the candidates in this race, I think we all are frustrated by similar things, right? We all talk about public safety, clean streets. Um, I also, of course, talk about the economic conditions. I will say that one of the ideas, uh, actually an existing policy practice in some of the districts, uh, particularly from Board of Supervisor uh, Asha Safai, as well as uh, uh, Supervisor Rafael Mandelman, that they already institute is something that I would love to champion in our District 3. So, uh, by the way, both of the, them have endorsed me, and uh, they are two of my eight uh, Board of Supervisor endorsements. Um, but both of them have a, a public safety liaison um, in their respective districts that uh, it's funded slightly differently and structured differently. But for example, in Supervisor uh, Safai's district, he has embedded his liaison within the police department. And the main role of that individual is to be the point of contact um, for coordinating across city departments when there is a public safety issue. All right, Danny, your thoughts. I think something that we're all committed to is making sure that all of District 3 gets its resources, all of District 3 gets its attention. There is a, um, I would say over the past few decades, there's been a tendency to focus on a few neighborhoods in District 3, and we forget about others. And, and I'll go back. Yeah, what's an yeah, example? I'll go of back that? to that, that example of Lower Knob Hill, which I called out at the beginning, because, um, you know, people don't realize that 
you know, but I think maybe people, people realize that Knob Hill is in District 3, but when they think of that, they think of, you know, Huntington Park or the Fairmont or Grace Cathedral, which are incredible. Um, but they don't realize that now uh, District 3 goes all the way to Geary. It goes to the north side of Geary. And, and these are neighborhoods that are incredibly dense. These are neighborhoods that uh, are, are a little bit more affordable than the rest of San Francisco, are relatively affordable. Uh, and so we have a, a lot of uh, people living in Lower Knob Hill, and they're asking for support. They're asking for resources. Edward? Well, I think we all probably uh, fall together on things regarding safety. And I don't think anyone has n necessarily a negative idea on safety. Um, I do think we have contrasting views in terms of how to get it done. Whoever comes in has to know how to build coalitions, has to know how to uh, deal with complexity, has to know how to deal with being practical. Sometimes uh, one has to be very creative in getting a solution done because the amount of time even allotted during one legislature will not allow for substantial changes in that infrastructure or that bureaucratic infrastructure. So I think that's one of those things, being realistic about that. And Sharon, let's say it's the day after election, you get elected and you're given a magic wand to do one thing, you don't have to go to other supervisors, you don't have to get mayoral support. So you got a magic wand, Sharon, one thing you can do, it can't be you know everything in the world. What do you use that magic wand on for the residents of District 3? I would love to immediately fill back our downtown buildings, all of those vacancies that we have right now. Class A buildings are, are about 20% down, but the rest of the Class B and C buildings are actually very much suffering. Um, I would immediately fill those buildings with young, innovative uh, companies that are good for our climate agenda. Uh, I would make sure that we immediately uh, convert some of those Class B and C buildings that are appropriate uh, to become residential uses and make sure that we bring foot traffic back to downtown. Uh, because uh, you know, as we talked about earlier, you know, the, the liveliness and the foot traffic in downtown really does have a huge impact on small businesses, especially in the nearby neighborhoods, Union Square, Polk, Chinatown, even North Beach. We really rely on that foot traffic. OK, Edward, we need a design framework in the city so we can build as much housing as we want. And literally, we could build as much housing as we want, but we don't have to resort to skyscrapers on the water. There is a lack of attention to public space and architecture as a tool to resolve a lot of the issues that we're facing as a city. There's, there are countless projects on the books that, and there's a fight between so-called progressives and moderates about housing. And I think neither side has a way to articulate what they're really wanting. Paris is a city that is 106 square kilometers. San Francisco is 124. So more or less, they're the same size. But Paris has three times the population of San Francisco. It's three times the population. It's about two and a half million people. Now, you would say, well, uh, so Paris should be a really tall city. It's not. We don't think of Paris as a tall city. We can build 82,000 units in the city. We wouldn't even notice if it's done well. Mo, back to you. Civil service reform. Right now, it takes way too long for the city to hire somebody. Uh, and it takes way too long for the city government to just uh, manage its human capital. Then we could right size our government and we can be able to get in the talent that we need uh, to really be an effective city and to make sure that the city bureaucracy is responding to neighbors. Because uh, right now there's a feeling that the various city departments are not super engaged with where the neighborhood and community are. Danny? If we're doing one thing, it's an incredibly difficult question, but the, the first thing that comes to mind, because I've ha been having a lot of conversations about this, is I want to introduce to District 3 a new special use district where we're encouraging more senior and family housing units. And in return for that, we're giving developers greater density, greater allowance. And we're saying that, you know, if you want to go up an additional floor or two, you can do that in return for these priority types of housing units. District 3 has the highest concentration of older adults of any district in San Francisco. It's also the fastest growing age group. And there's a lot of unique challenges around housing for seniors. And so I want us to build as much housing as possible, but I want that to be senior housing if possible. I want it to be family housing if possible. You know, families, even if they have the means to, to afford the expensive housing in San Francisco, they're not able to stay in District 3 because there's not enough housing units that are two and three and four bedrooms. Uh, and those are the sorts of housing units that I want us to create. And I think introducing a special use district specific to District 3 would allow us to do that. I'm running for the Board of Trustees because City College holds the key to solving San Francisco's toughest challenges.
San Francisco is a safe place to deal drugs. No one is really in charge. I do not have confidence in City Hall. We might propose a solution. Every time you put up a gatekeeper, you put up the potential for corruption. If you have hope, if you think you can solve it, you'll work towards it. You're not alone. If you care about safe streets and a fully staffed police department, care about City College. Will you join me? Edward, yeah. do you consider San Francisco city government ineffective? Do you consider it corrupt? Does it suffer from corruption, in your opinion? I think sometimes we can mistake inefficiency for corruption. I do think we have incredible amounts of inefficiency. We have a, a $16 billion budget is insane. It's, it's, it's incredible wealth. Yet, uh, how efficient is it in our spending? I think that that uh, brings up a lot of questions. And it brings up a lot of questions probably because I think the way that it was designed is beautiful. Is uh, There's always an intent in San Francisco to make things democratic, to spread out the responsibility, to get a lot of voices, a lot of stakeholders involved. But that parliamentary way of running things becomes quite cumbersome and results in a lot of, a lot of just friction and, and expense or lack of accountability. And I think our objectives, what I promote, my three main topics are, we need to uh, um, save our public space, is be kind to our public space and reclaim it as part of everyone's use. We need to build with heart. We need to be able to, hey, let the market forces play out 82,000 or 160,000 units. Really, it's not a problem. It's a, but the problem is we have to make it in a way that is enhancing of uh, San Francisco's beauty. But in reality, we have to be very proud of San Francisco and defend our values. Sharon, what do you think? I think we have a major accountability issue. I think that we have an issue of um, the efforts and a lot of the laws that we have to try to prevent the really bad things from happening is also negatively impacting the good players. We have what I would consider a very uh, inefficient outcome um, because what's happening is that we are we actually have a lot of like regulation and requirements as, as a nonprofit you know person that, you know I've worked in nonprofit sectors before. Um, some of the small nonprofits are very much burdened by a lot of the over, like the reporting requirements, but yet those reporting requirements are actually not preventing the really bad actors from still taking advantage of the system. I think it's absolutely important that in our current uh, financial situation within the city, yes, we have to grow back our revenues and make sure that we're no longer in a budget deficit, but we also have to be smarter and more responsible when it comes to our expenditures. And this is where my expertise and my background will come into play. You, you know, previously asked about, you know, how I am different from the other candidates. You know, honestly, I think a lot of us uh, are frustrated by similar issues at the city. And I think we all want change, but this race isn't about who cares the most. It's about who can actually deliver uh, the change that the city really needs on the good government side. Mo, agree or disagree? It's disturbing that over the last couple of years, we've seen scandal after scandal. I do think that we need wholesale change in some of the ways that we do things, particularly contracting. Um, we should have a public process. You know, when we have uh, small groups of people deciding who gets major contracts, that's just a recipe uh, for potential corruption. So I think we need to continue efforts at greater accountability, transparency um, to improve this, because the reality is when you go to City Hall, if you're a business or whatnot and you have death by uh, 10,000 permits. The unfortunate secret is it feels like uh, city government has created a cartel which exists to benefit itself and doesn't help the interests of small businesses and ordinary residents. And that is a very complex problem. It did not uh, happen overnight. It built up after over decades. Uh, but I am prepared to partner with the mayor and other members of the board to um, pass some common sense reforms to try to get get some improvement there. Danny, agree? There are parts of our government that are working really well. I think it's incumbent upon us to, to find out what's working in some of those departments and take it over to the rest. There's a lot of waste. Um, there's a lot of uh, duplicative work, right? You know, the fact that there's nine different departments that touch homelessness, um, that there's multiple different uh, programs uh, that should be combined, that we have, you know, almost 200 different commissions and committees and working bodies and task force. Um, 
So, so I am thankful that there, I think, are some serious efforts to re make reform, to look at our commissions, to look at our charter. Um, you know, th this city and, and this giant bureaucracy of our $16 billion budget, nearly 40,000 city employees, um, you know, from time to time, it needs to be revised. It needs to be modified and edited. And I think there's some some good people working on that right now. And Sharon, final question I want to ask you is just um, something very relevant to District 3, relevant to the whole city, which is um, something I'm, I'm really interested in, City College of San Francisco. City College of San Francisco has been under, you know, tough times. There was a lot of people who fought to get a branch campus in Chinatown, which is in District 3. Right. What do you think the importance of City College is to District 3 residents? What should we be doing differently when it seems like that campus is underutilized? to say it mildly in Chinatown. Uh, I'm someone who really believes in education. Actually, I'm somebody who also worked on the universal child care measure and I supported the Free City College. Um, and, you know, that campus is so important to our community. I, I am someone who believes that, you know, City College is there to provide lifelong learning, to provide opportunities to continue to uh, have upward mobility. And so I really believe that access to education to minority communities is extremely important. Uh, and, uh, you know, primarily in, in the Chinatown uh, campus. And it's not just that, because we also have a nearby campus on 4th Street, which, you know, I think Again, as a city planner, I'd like to think about things uh, more than just beyond district <laughs> lines, right? We should be thinking about our, our district as District uh, 36 and District 35, right? So we're adjacent. Um, but, you know, the importance of City College is not just in providing, you know, uh, people who are currently trying to uh, get additional training, because I do think that that's really important. But it's also, you know, for example, a lot of people rely on the Cantonese classes at uh, City College to uh, have that tool so that they can communicate with their community members. Edward, agree? I think that the world of education generally is, is evolving. It's changing. Uh, the, the cachet or the value of certain studies and what they mean uh, to the, your one's profession is also evolving. There are many new industries coming up. So I think having a, a city college that uh, has a, a wide array of potential coursework and, and different, um, different uh, lines of study is very positive. Mo, your thoughts? City College is enormously important and valuable uh, for District 3, in particular the Chinatown campus. City College is not only a place where you can go and get your transfer credits and go on to UC or Cal State, but it's a community resource. So it's a resource for new immigrants to learn English. It's a resource for uh, folks who wanna learn a trade or a skill. It's a resource for recreation. Uh, and I think all those things are vitally important. You know, District 3 is the densest district in the city. Um, the location of that campus is fantastic for public transit, uh, for walkability. But I think City College does need to do a better job of marketing and branding itself uh, to the Chinese community, to other uh, communities. Um, and that could really, really help City College. And I will stand as a partner uh, with City College to make that happen. Danny, your thoughts? We're always looking for space. We're always looking for, for places to hold meetings, uh, to hold talks. And for City College to have that and not use it to its full ability, I think is, is unfortunate. It can be a space for the neighborhood to gather. And I think that exposes it to the residents to, to make them realize that, hey, this is also a place to come and take classes. We have one of our volunteers who's taking English classes there and, and they're having a fantastic experience, but there's too many uh, members that are right there in Chinatown, right there in, in North Beach or Russian Hill who don't know about it as a resource. Uh, and it needs to be more open. It needs to be more embraced by the community. Uh, and, and that's something I'd like to partner on you with. City College was, it was founded in 1935 to be the pipeline of critical workers sure. for a changing city. Sure, sure. So all of these problems, whether it is public safety, whether mm -hmm. it's parts of civic disorder or homelessness or the drug crisis, it was supposed to supply critical workers sure. to do that. And it's a lot easier to home, you know, grow your own homegrown talent who sure. cares about the community sure. than import those from elsewhere to come in. And so that's why I think it's an underutilized, yeah. overlooked solution mm -hmm. to a lot of these problems in the long term. Let's grow the people who care about the city 
who can be the critical workers in city government to right. improve our city. Well, thank you so much. Good luck on your candidacy. Board me. of Supervisors, District 3. Thanks for joining us on We Are San Francisco. Thank you, We Are San Francisco. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Ben. Okay. Sharon, thank you for joining us on We Are San Francisco. Thank you very much. Appreciate this. Danny Sauter, best of luck on your campaign. Thank you, Ben. Happy to be here. Mo Jamil, thank you so much for joining us on We Are San Francisco. Thank you, Ben, and We Are San Francisco. All right, that's a wrap on today's episode of We Are San Francisco. A big thanks to Danny Sauter, Edward Navarro, Mo Jamil, and Sharon Lai for sharing their thoughts and ideas for District 3. It's always inspiring to hear from those who are passionate about making a difference in our city. And hey, if you enjoyed this conversation, stay tuned. We've got more candidates from other districts coming up soon, so you won't want to miss that. Make sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and keep an eye out for those episodes. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.